Welcome back. Welcome back to everyone here. Welcome back to everyone on Zoom. Uh, you know, this workshop actually began, we think, in a January, right. in the middle of the year. So that means we are right now embarking on our 32nd year of weekly seminars uh, since we began in 1993. Uh, I'm Zach Lesser. I'm a professor in the English department. I run the seminar along with John Pollock of the Kislak Center, Jerry Singerman, Humanities Editor Emeritus at the Penn Press, and Lila Goldenberg, who is the Bristol Schoenberg Fellow in the History of Material Text and makes this all happen. Um, so we've got a great lineup of talks this semester. If you haven't seen it, it will appear at the bottom of the email. If you haven't gotten the email, you can get on our email list by adding your name to the sign-in sheet that's going around. Well, add your name to the sign-in sheet that's going around regardless, but add your email as well if you'd like to get on the email list. And if you want to see the lineup of talks, you can also see it at our website, penmaterialtext.org. Uh, but we have a wide-ranging group of talks, including Brazilian newspapers of the 1920s and manuscript culture in 18th century northern China, medieval English prayer books, and early modern Japanese books of piety, classical Roman writing equipment, and early modern English writing equipment. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a wide-ranging semester, but I think has some intriguing overlaps and contiguities. So um, should be fun, and we hope to see you again, whether you come every week or every once in a while. Um, so I was shocked when I realized that David Wallace is speaking to this group today for the first time in 27 years. <laughs> <laughs> So he was here almost at the beginning of this group, and he last spoke to us, uh, those of us who were here, on October 7th, 1996, which I know from our searchable database on the website of all our talks going back to 1996, which is the first semester for which we have data. The first three years of the seminar are completely lost in the mists, the mists of time. Before, what are they, in England, they, in English law, they call that before recorded memory. Um, so uh, he spoke to us in 1996, the first semester that he was here at Penn after teaching at Minnesota. And so a mere 27 years later, we've invited him back. <laughs> uh, I'm really glad he said yes. Uh, David is the Judith Roden Professor of English. He also has an appointment in Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies and has long been a key figure also in Italian studies here at Penn. From 2001 to 2004, he was chair of the English department. He's also served as president of the New Chaucer Society and of the Medieval Academy. David's work spans the medieval and early modern periods, a division I think he doesn't much care for or, or honor, certainly, <laughs> and beyond those periods. And it spans across the national boundaries of Europe and beyond. His first books explored Chaucer in relation to the Italian Trecento authors Dante, Boccaccio, and Petrarch. Chaucerian polity, absolute lineages and associational forms in England and, and Italy won the James Russell Lowell Prize in 1997 from the MLA for the best book of the year. And there are many other awards on his CV, including the Israel Golan's Prize in 2019 and the Ira Abrams Award, which is the highest teaching honor in arts and sciences. Uh, but there are too many to list them all. More recently, his work has moved well beyond England and Italy, well beyond the 13th and 14th centuries. Um, recent books include Pre-Modern Places, Calais to Suriname, Chaucer to Aprobain, 2004, Strong Women, Life, Text, and Territory, 2011, which focuses on four women from Dorothea of Montal in Prussia, who was born in 1347, to Mary Ward of Yorkshire, who died in 1645. And then there's the OUP two-volume mammoth study, Europe, a Literary History, 1348 to 1418, in which David somehow herded 83 <laughs> leading scholar cats into writing a new literary history before the nation state and before the idea of national literature. His new project is National Epics, nationalepics.com, in which, again, collaborating very widely, David undertakes a comparative history of the epic, as the about page puts it, from Albania and Algeria to Vietnam and Wales. The website is ongoing and I urge you to explore it. It's fun to click around on it. The project will also result in another magnum print opus from Oxford with another 80 some odd scholars contributing. So there's way too much to introduce here. 
a translation of Pasolini's Ashes of Gramsci, which I, who knew? Um, advising the History Channel for a show about medieval torture implements, which I have not seen, but I think I want it. Um, much more, but I'm going to stop and let him start. And tonight we'll see even more of his wide ranging interest, his excitement about crossing traditional geographical and period divisions in our discipline, and his career long investment in showing audiences why the medieval matters, as he tells us about Walt Whitman's Inferno, Bryn Mawr College, and the American Civil War. So please join me in welcoming David Wallace back to the summit. Okay. Thanks, Zach, for that lovely introduction. I barely recognized myself. It's great. Uh, I thank you all for making the decision to come on such a miserable day. I really appreciate it. And uh, also greetings to everybody in Zoom land. Uh, it's a great thrill to be here at Material Text. I am a medievalist, and so therefore I need to be a bit material. We all are materialist medievalists. But disappointingly to the library, I've often worked with large canonical figures and large geographies and histories. So uh, I'm very glad to come back. I think all of us have this experience. Sometimes you're in a project and you think, oh, my God, I'm wandering into material text territory. And that's yeah. simply what happened to me when I was uh, getting immersed in this. Like, I need to turn myself in now. So I did <laughs> after 27 years on the lamb, right? Uh, I'd like to thank Mariana Hansen, the curator of rare books and manuscripts at Bryn Mawr College for facilitations during my visit there. Um, there's a tremendous amount of Walt Whitman expertise in the room and online. Um, Sorry, trying to advance the click. Huh. I've already failed my first technical testing. Uh, click on, yeah, click that. Click this first. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. Uh, so this is forthcoming. It's not even in the pen library yet. Uh, the Oxford Handbook of Walt Whitman. You can see a vast amount of knowledge there. Um, and anniversaries are important. Uh, we had one actually at Penn uh, in celebrating the the uh, 700th anniversary of Dante's demise, uh, which is pretty important for Dante, if you think about it. You write the Divine Comedy, you die, and you go see if it's all true. Uh, right? And uh, so I wanted to do something particularly in the pen tradition. So I got together here with, uh, with Herman Beavers, and we had an evening on Africana Dante's, in which we invited a number of poets to uh, improvise and think about uh, Dante in any way that they were so inspired. And it was a great... Kelly Ryder's House event. Um, Herm, as you know, is the new president of the Modern Language Association, or we will be. Uh, and a lovely detail from that photograph that makes it period, you can identify it, is the little doggy bag over the microphone. Yeah. Can you see that there? The little green doggy bag. Um. <laughs> um, there's a, uh, 1865 is uh, another huge anniversary that was the anniversary of Dante's birth, and that was coincided with, of course, Italy coming together as a unified nation, and it inspired all sorts of activity, including Longfellow's monumental um, translation of Dante, um, and this rather battered-looking set here. But it's a it's a it's a very grand set actually. And I discovered a, another sort of library-related thing that where would you find most of Longfellow and Dante and translations? In Philly, you'd find them here, which kind of makes sense. The Athenaeum uh, has got uh, wonderful collections. Okay, so the talk is in uh, two parts. Uh, the first part is 1862, 1865, and all that. And then there's a short coda of an entirely material, uh, possibly pathogenic nature. Um, so it's not possible for the actual book from Bryn Mawr to be here this evening, I'm afraid. So in my coder, I've put in some images uh, to, to look at the material state of the of the codex and uh, the images I hope will stand in for it. And I will honor the code of the seminar by not talking too long, right? Um, there's always the temptation to run down the clock by keep talking to avoid your penetrating questions, but I will not go too long. So uh, 1865 is perhaps the most potent date of all for American Dante, because it signals the end of civil war, the end of slavery, and the 600th anniversary of Dante's birth. And Longfellow sent a copy of his new Inferno translation to Florence uh, to sort of celebrate. And his covering letter celebrates both Dante 
and congressional approval of the amendment to end slavery. On the 14th of May, 1865, a new statue was unveiled in Florence at the Piazza Santa Croce, a 19 foot tall Dante mounted on a 20 foot plinth. The sculptor was, sculptor was Enrico Pazzi and the plinth features emblems of leading Italian cities now united in the new nation of Italy. Dante commands this key Florentine space as the prophet of union. And it's touching to learn that this statue was unveiled one month to the day after Abraham Lincoln's assassination. In American abolitionist circles, Dennis Looney has written, Dante was on a par with no less than Lincoln. Alfred Douglas took a close interest in the Italian liberation struggle. And the North Star, the anti-slavery paper he founded in 1847, frequently suggested that the Italian people were, under Austrian rule, enduring something like slavery. The 1865 centennial then, as shared between Italy and America, braids bloodshed and sacrifice in the cause of union, while envisioning a liberated future. Frederick Douglass actually kept an image of Dante in his library, and he's been described as the most photographed American of the 19th century. And here are some examples. He sat for more than 160 sittings across the nation, um, and he devoted a lot of thought and studio time to image projection uh, throughout his life. Here's a nice example you can still see at the University of Rochester. Um, there's a very nice correspondence with, with him, and uh, he says, I am content to be made known through this specimen of your art to all who may come after me. And uh, I think Dante's iconography is very famous, the images of Dante, and uh, Douglas is really saying, this is what the prophet of liberty looks like. So it's a, a very 1865 moment. So here you can get your bust of Douglas from the very, very same collection, as uh, you can get your Dante. So back to Longfellow for a moment. Uh, another you know, amazing kind of iconography there of, of Longfellow. Um, and then just a brief glance at Dante and the Anglo-American death cult of the 80, early 1860s, which some of you will know about um, through uh, the Pre-Raphaelites and the cult of Lizzie Siddle, who was a painter, an artist model, and ultimately the wife to Dante, Gabrielle Rossetti, who committed suicide on the 11th of February by overdosing on laudanum, 1862. Um, uh, Rossetti was very classy. He, he actually buried uh, a collection of poems with the coffin. And then a few years later, he thought, there's some pretty good poems in there. So he actually exhumed the body, <laughs> got the poems out and, and published them. So yeah. just to sort of say that there are a lot of synergies between uh, American Dantism and British Dantism in the 1860s that have been that can be traced out, but that's another paper. Um, so uh, in 1831, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow married his childhood sweetheart Mary Sora Potter. Four years later, she died while accompanying him on a European trip. Well, while she was six months pregnant, and Longfellow wrote the sonnet Mezzo Camin. He married again and between 1847 and 1855 had six children with Fanny Appleton and his song of Hiawatha was published in 1855. On the 9th of July 1861 however Fanny's dress caught fire and Longfellow burned himself attempting to save her unsuccessfully. He grew a beard it was said to hide the scars. The American Civil War began in 1861, three months before Fanny Appleton died. And in 1863, Longfellow's son, Charlie, went off to fight. Longfellow's translating of Dante intensified through the war years with new images of horror of unprecedented scale filtering back from the battlefields. A liminal lonely moment at the beginning of Inferno II sees Dante himself alone, Io Soluno, in Dante's formulation, preparing to commit both to hellish journeying and the commitment to feeling what he sees. I think this is really important for Whitman. 
Alan Mandelbaum, in his fine 1980 translation, has Dante speak of being prepared to undergo the battle. Longfellow re renders Dante's a sostener la guerra as simply and literally to sustain the war. So war is real. As Longfellow translates, America is in a war like no other, and interior experiences of horror find correlatives week by week on American ground. New arts of photography are capturing battlefield carnage in stark detail, albeit through imaging technology that is itself spectral and evanescent. Teaching Dante under lockdown was pretty amazing because it was a spectral Dante uh, and spectral students, and we were all spectral to one another. So I learned a lot in, in those lockdown years. As early as 1846, Walt Whitman visited a daguerreotype portrait gallery in Manhattan and was deeply affected by the great legion of human faces that he found there, human eyes gaining silently but fixedly upon you, he reported, and creating the impression of an immense phantom concourse, speechless and motionless, but yet realities. From as early as 1855, Whitman was reading Dante intensively in translation. And he at some point eagerly acquired a copy of Longfellow's 1867 translation, now in the Library of Congress and bearing his signature. But another translation said to be owned by Whitman is to be found in the library at Bryn Mawr College, Pennsylvania, just nine miles down the road from us right here. This is the literal prose translation of the Inferno by John Aiken Carlyle from 1849. So you get hold of the book and you think, I wonder if there'll be a signature, you know. And so, well, there we are. It's pretty <laughs> fantastic signatures that Whitman did, right? This was published by Chapman and Hall in London and by Harper and Brothers in New York. And Whitman owned a copy of the American edition in which he inscribed the date of July 1862. The months immediately preceding this date had been hard and bloody for the Union, with 13,000 soldiers killed at Shiloh, plus 11,000 Confederates. That was in April 1862. The month after, Stonewall Jackson drove Union forces back across the Potomac. On the 31st of May, Confederate troops almost defeated Federal forces at Seven Pines and Robert E. Lee then assumed command of the Army of Northern Virginia. This then is what Whitman inscribed on the title page of his Inferno edition at that time. Professor Charles Witter of Berlin, Prussia, after many years investigation, etc., and collecting 407 manuscript copies of the Inferno, has just published a new edition based on four of the most authentic manuscripts at Rome. Florence and Berlin. With it, it is said, important variations from preceding editions. It is in one large volume quarto with a photographic portrait of Dante. Now the edition to which Whitman refers here is that of Karl Witter, who lived from 1800 to 1883, a jurist and a wunderkind who did enjoy an international reputation. So I look at Liliana to maybe tell us a bit more about him later. We might consider it strange that Whitman should be, as we might say, geeking out here in 1862 over a new and more authoritative edition of Dante. But we might flip this around to say Whitman was fully aware of the horrors that civil war was bringing to friends, family, and indeed all American humanity. He would become a nurse, and by the end of his collection drum taps in the very last poem, he could say, I have nourished the wounded and soothed many a dying soldier. Years later, in 1888, he was to recognize the Civil War years as, quote, the very center, circumference, umbilicus of my whole career. How remarkable then that he turns to Dante so urgently in these dire circumstances. Whitman was indeed making extensive notes on Dante in his notebook for 1862, the year which ended with his seeking out his wounded brother George in the Union camp at Falmouth, Virginia. Such intensity of engagement is also suggested by the pages of the Bryn Mawr Dante through a series of energetic pencil annotations. 
Now, John Aitken Carlyle, who lived from 1801 to 1879, was the younger and less talented brother of the formidable Thomas Carlyle, who thought his younger sibling, Thomas Carlyle thought his younger sibling, known as Jack, as somewhat idle and helter-skelter. I'm an older brother myself. <laughs> um, Jack did vacillate between letters and medicine, but few could survive comparison with the author of Sartor Resartus, a man considered in the 1858 Saturday Review as, quote, the most indignant and least cheerful of all living writers. <laughs> and Jack Carlyle had spent almost seven years in Italy, so some qualification. He was the private physician of the Countess of Clare, which is a fairly easy job. But on the other hand, give him lots of spare time to do other things. Thus, his assessments of past translations in his 1849 preface are worth hearing. That of Henry Boyd, he says, may be considered obsolete, and they are pretty terrible. Um, Carey's, he continues, is a most excellent translation of its kind. <laughs> what kind is that, we one wonders? <laughs> the sort of verse in which it is written, says Jack, takes away much of the familiar and direct tone of the original. And here and there, one finds evidence of a somewhat imperfect acquaintance with Italian. <laughs> This may have interested Whitman on two grounds. Firstly, the 1814 blank verse translation of Henry Francis Carey, which was endorsed publicly by Coleridge in 1818, and was much loved by John Keats, uh, and is really regarded extremely highly, and I certainly grew up regarding it extremely highly. This adheres to an oratorical and occasionally oratund English poetic that can be traced from Milton through Wordsworth, Coleridge's collaborator. And this is not what Walt Whitman was looking for. And secondly, as his note on Whit's new edition suggests, Whitman, Whitman was keen to come as close as possible to the language of Dante. And for this, Carlyle's prose translation, intercut on each page with the Italian original, served him admirably. Now, before Carlyle's edition, all eight English translations of the Commedia had been in verse of some kind. And after Carlyle, too, the great majority of renditions have been poetic, with some brave and misguided attempts at terza rima. In stretching for the third rhyme word of a tercet, an English poet can stray into archaism, tortuous word order, fanciful combinations. Prose can be straightforward, what it says on the tin. Serious readers might thus gravitate to parallel texts featuring English prose. The editions of J.D. Sinclair and C.S. Singleton have enjoyed long shelf lives in Britain and America, and Derling Martinez is holding up nicely the latest version. Carlyle served Whitman comparably well. Consider these opening lines from a poem in Drum Taps. A march in the ranks hard pressed, and the road unknown, a route through a heavy wood with muffled steps in the darkness. Lawrence Kramer, in his excellent edition of Drum Tap, sees this as loosely paraphrasing the opening of Dante's Inferno, which Whitman would have known in the translation of H.S. Carey. Sorry, I got, I got the wrong order. Have we shot forward? Oh, okay. Uh, no, it's still one more. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is um, the editor Kramer, loosely paraphrasing the opening of Dante's Inferno, which Whitman would have known in the translation of H.F. Carey. Well, that's an assumption many of us make. In the midway of this our mortal life, I found me in a gloomy wood astray, gone from the path direct. Now compare this padded out parade of redundancies to the simplicity of Carlyle. In the middle of the journey of our life, I found myself in a dark wood, for the right way was lost. A good pr prose translation in a parallel text directs the reader's attention to the original, interposing as little as possible between reader and poet. Carlyle's edition does this admirably. Whitman's copy features a series of pencil marks, as said, each lighting upon short passages of particular interest. In Whitman's note on Witt's new edition, we saw a number of emphatic underlinings and the word Prussia 
bracketed in pencil. Pencil bracketing of sentences in Carlyle's translation begins at the end of Inferno 6 and goes on for the rest of the Cantica. This pencil moves fluently, somewhat hurriedly, sometimes excitedly, and in following along, one retraces the experience of a reader closely engaged with the text. Whitman's Inferno contains about two dozen pencil interventions, with the Italian underlined just twice. And the first comes early, glossing the word giorno. The second comes near the end on page 336, Inferno 32. And this is perhaps the most animated page in the whole book. And here we can see two bracketings and the underlined Italian verse. I should press out the juice of my conception more fully. For to describe the bottom of all the universe is not an enterprise for being taken up in sport, nor for a tongue that cries mamma and papa. Nida lingua che chiami mamma e babbo. Dante begins Inferno 32 by meditating on the challenge of expressing the deepest and the darkest depths of horror, a theme broached at the opening of Inferno 28. And this too moves the pencil in Whitman's Inferno. Who, even with words set free, could ever fully tell by off relating the blood and the wounds that now I saw. Every tongue assuredly would fail because of our speech and our memory that have small capacity to comprehend so much. The first of Carlyle's notes here offers the gloss to the Italian below, free from verse or rhyme, verso sciolto, blank verse, parole sciolte, prose. The second, on the fallibility of tongue and memory, refers the reader to a Latin passage of Dante's Epistle de Can Grande on that very topic. And this draws a rapid curving pencil stroke. Concerned with remembering of recognizing the human person, even in extremes of degradation and dismemberment, is especially active deep down in the inferno. And Canto 29 of Whitman's Carlyle excites another slash light bracketing. Dante at Virgil's prompting addresses two highly disfigured individuals. And I began as he desired. So may your memory not fade away from human minds in the first world, but may it live for many circling suns. Tell me who ye are and of what nation. Let not your ugly and disgusting punishment fright ye from revealing yourselves to me. Steady contemplation of horror, discerning the human person, commitment to memory and to finding love and hope amid darkness and degradation remain consistent themes for this pencil. Especially forceful is the marginal marking of Inferno 12, where Virgil remembers hell rocked by harrowing. On all sides, the deep loathsome valley trembled so that I thought the universe felt love. The last three markings preserve this balance or liminal suspension between absolute negation on the one hand and affirmation, a way forward, a way out. First is made to Carlyle's prose argument before the very last canto where uniquely we find a penciled star. Mm -hmm. And now the bitter journey of our pilgrim is over and a tone of gladness goes through the remaining verses. Hell is now behind him. And the star, oh, sorry, <laughs> beg your pardon. I'll just tell you. It's not a call from the afterlife, my son. Um, yeah. Um, yes. And now the bitter journey of our pilgrim is over, and tone of gladness goes through uh, the remaining verses. Hell is now behind him, and the stars of heaven above. He has got beyond the everlasting no, and is sore travailed, and the way is long and difficult, but it leads from darkness to the bright world and the little reference to Sartor Resartus. So our annotator recognizes that J.A. Carlyle is referring here to the most celebrated work of Brother Thomas, an author revered by Whitman. British thought without Carlyle, Whitman said in 1881, on learning of his death, would be like an army with no artillery. Sartor Resartus, which had sold some 69,000 copies by 1881, was first published in book form in Boston 
1836, and then in London two years later. And it, pro it proved especially influential in New England and among transcendentalists. Whitman knew that the everlasting no of the middle book of Sartor Resartus pairs with the everlasting yea that comes two chapters later. The last two pencil marks of his inferno give us each in turn. First, the everlasting no, so to speak, marked by a pencil parenthesis that opens but never closes, and by a line down the right-hand margin. Standing before Satan, and following one last expression of inexpressibility, neither living nor dead, Dante turns at this extreme and lonely threshold to the reader. Whitman famously is a master of such intimate interpolating. How icy, chill and hoarse I then became asked not a reader, for I write it not, for all speech would fail to tell. I did not die and did not remain alive. Now think for thyself, if thou hast any grain of ingenuity, what I became deprived of both death and life. And secondly, and lastly, the yea, as Virgil and Dante climb up to escape hell. He first and I second. So far that I distinguish through a round opening the beauteous things which heaven bears, and thence we issued out again to see the stars. Che porri il ciel per un perturchio tondo, e quindi uscim a rivedere le stelle. Whitman first saw the army camps and hospitals of the Civil War late in December 1862, searching for his wounded brother, George. He later worked as a nurse, a washer of bodies, a dresser of wounds, exposing him to extremes of suffering. Not Virgil showing Dante on and on amid the agonized and damned, he writes in a letter of uh, March 1863, approach what here I see and take a part in. Drum taps, his poetic collection is full of phantoms, but it is also, as in Hymn of Dead Soldiers, full of resolution to raise hope from carnage. Dearest comrades, all now is over, but love is not over. And what love, O oh comrades? Perfume from battlefields rising up from Fetor, arising. It's the broad act of faith of the Commedia and specifically of the Inferno that informs this three-line stanza rather than local phrasing. The poem's last tercet, however, does see Whitman asking for what Dante later claims as his modus agendi, his way of loving and being, the gerunds, really beautiful. Give me exhaustless, make me a fountain, that I exhale love from me wherever I go for the sake of all dead soldiers. If we return to Whitman's poem and march in the ranks hard pressed, we can appreciate how scenes in the large old church, now an impromptu hospital, draw from Dante, although Whitman is also drawing from his own hospital notebook of 1863-64, the period of Robert E. Lee's greatest battlefield triumph at Chancellorsville. Again, it's the general state of horror and the determination in some way to keep faith with this, with this place that is most resolutely Dantean and the eye for visual and auditory detail. An occasional scream or cry the doctors shouted orders or calls, the glisten of the little steel instruments catching the glint of the torches. Most Dante-like of all, perhaps, is the harrowing poem, The Dresser, in which Whitman imagines himself forwards, looking backward. That is, as an old man, he responds to the call of children. Come tell us, old man, the war he imagines is now long over, and he must remember himself back into it by act of will to his work of dressing mortal wounds, witnessing and hearing amputations, tracing the path of bullets through flesh, comforting the dying. So soon what is over is forgotten, he says, and waves wash the imprints off the sand. I am faithful, he says later, I do not give out. Here Whitman shows deep comprehension of Inferno 2-4's A Sostener La Guerra, not just to survive the war, but fully to feel the war, to take it in and to carry forward memory of it and all who died. Thank you.
So I know I do stray into literary criticism, but now I'm going to just do the brief coda, uh, which will give you a little bit more tea, uh, for you material text people to work in. Uh, just a, an informal tour through a few moments here. There are other moments, uh, of course. I've just chosen a particular path through the 24 or so annotations in pencil. Uh, there are other moments that other kinds of readers may want to dwell on and ponder. Um, here is one. Uh, this is Inferno 15. Now with Whitman, you, that's pretty interesting. It's Inferno 15, um, where he does indeed linger. And he lingers actually on a, uh, a beautiful poetic metaphor uh, about perception, looking, peering through gloom. He's very interested in that. Uh, as in the evening, men are wont to look at one another under a new moon and toward us sharpen their vision as an old tailor does at the eye of his needle. So that's there. But where are we? We're in Inferno 15 and we're about to meet Brunetto Latini, his old master. Um, there, uh, there for sodomy. Uh, are you there, Sir Brunetto? Even another little point of detail is, and I, when he stretched out his arm to me, fixed my eyes on his baked aspect. What happened to Carlyle's edition? You, it's, I mean, I personally underestimate its importance, but it turns out it, it fed into the Temple Classics translation. And that was a very influential translation, uh, as used by Ezra Pound and, and T.S. Eliot, actually. And so if you look at the wasteland, when he, uh, you see the figures based on Brunetto Latini, he talked about his baked aspect. That's aspetto cotto, baked aspect, straight out of uh, originally Carlisle. Uh, and just little phrases, because you're a poet, anything that you know really strikes you. But what brings thee to such a biting pickle, he says, finding uh, these sinners in Malabolgia being whipped around in circles. Uh, and poets just sort of light on things they really like. A biting pickle is rather good. You can see it's line 51. Macchetti mena si pungenti salse. So, and then finally, oops, sorry. Um, the back button, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, this is um, th this is uh, the uh, uh, the Ulysses Canto, famous Ulysses Canto, as dwelled upon, of course, by um, T. S. Eliot, but most famously by Tennyson, of course, uh, in his uh, in his Ulysses poem. Uh, when I saw myself come to that period of my age at which everyone should lower sails and gather in his ropes, that arrests the attention of of the reader. So just some more material things. Firstly, some of you may know more than, no, I know nothing, so you're going to know more than I do, about uh, the provenance of the book, The Gift of Julia Harned Pardee, 39, and Louise Harned. There's a, a cache of Whitmer materials at Bryn Mawr. Somebody may be able to tell us more about that. A nice ex libris book plate. Uh, title page right there. Engraving of Dante. Um, a literal prose translation. It's a rather nice uh, summary of what it actually is by John A. Carlyle, MD, using his Dr. Lee qualification. And it's the New York edition rather than the London one. Here is a, a close up of that um, annotation at the very beginning, a little close up. Um, another example of um, an annotation, Lo giorno, Latin diurnus, French jour. Um, physical condition. Uh, so some of you would have thought, what does a folded down page mean in material text terms, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you... <laughs> That's right. Here's a folded down page. Is it just a, a book in bad repair? Or you also got the pencil mark for FELTs. Uh, we're among the giants there. So uh, is this a physical condition issue or is it, uh, do you keep it? Do you straighten it out? I don't know. That's not my area for you to think about. Well, I could have been folding it, but the point adds yeah. much fiercer and larger. Ah. That's one comment. Here's yeah. Newton was a famous dog here. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. yep. say above my pay grade, but there are things you can think about with this. Is that the only dog here? I think so. I think so, yeah. So it might be a random one or not. 
Hmm. Uh, this paper is based on one visit to Bryn Mawr on the 3rd of May, 2023. <laughs> so there's a lots of scope for anybody to go out there and think about what this text amounts to. It's a deeply intriguing and I think underworked and underthought piece. So I, I invite anybody to go take a look. Uh, this is the this is the uh, the physical condition of the book. The covers, um, is that? I mean, what is that on the front? Blue ink is that? I don't know. At what stage do conservators get anxious and think we've got to do something about this book or not? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't think so. I'm trying to remember how it arrived. I don't. I don't remember to think those thoughts when when books arrive. So yeah, but that's a good thought. And then finally, this is deeply intriguing, right? What the heck is this? This is the back mold, purely mold, right? <laughs> Nothing more exciting. Pretty. It's pretty mold. So. So that just quickly throws out. <laughs> well, I'm going to start another round of applause. So, uh, and then we can have a question. It's interesting that he underlined that the word he's he said the first note is Giorno, which yeah. is like, yeah, but, he yeah. must know the word. I mean, yeah, it's very yeah. It's, it's Italian, first day of Italian class. But, but right, is he know, interested in the? In the sound, because the way it becomes jour and diurna, yeah, that's a good point. You know, as he may be thinking in terms of sound, yeah, yeah, yeah. meaning there. Um, anyway, the floor is the floor is open for questions, and Jerry will will start us off. Yes, Jerry. All right. Um, just a question about the book. Um, and the assumption here is that every marking you have seen is made by Whitman. And that the dog ear is done by Whitman. Um, are there any other kinds of marks in the book? I mean, there there is at least one very significant physical alteration to the book, which is the bookplate that has been pasted in. Right, right. So the whatever her name is, actually, it's a male name um, on the bookplate. It's not is not treating this as an untouchable object. Right, right, right. Um, so he has. Talks about that and, and yeah. he says he doesn't anything. I think that is their father. Uh, it's what, sorry? But who, who nevertheless is not treating this as a relative of Whitman, but I mean, bookplate is pasted in there. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't place it over the wall. No, that's right. I mean, are, are, again, are there, are there any interventions in the book other than the mold that? <laughs> the mold is so disappointing, and you, you answered that so summarily and absolutely that there's no chance of any more that interesting answer. Sometimes it is like it is. <laughs> so there, show the back. It was like, oh, that's really bad. Right, right, right. And what do you? Th what does that say? Is it say bright and white in pencil faintly at the top? I can't. Yeah, I was worried about that too. You had a it's something. Up of the it's, it's there's a plus in the middle. And yeah. yeah. It's also right. interesting to compare it to other books that Whitman owned. Yeah. Did he make pencil marks in yeah. other books that are comparable? Um, because books go to stores that Whitman ownership. Um, so there isn't a signature explicit mark, pencil mark. Yeah. Yep. Um, but if there is a pattern that can tell us of how he read, then we might. That would be that would be good to do. Um, as I say, I'm not a Whitman expert, and um, this is clearly um, one short section, slightly inflated, uh, of a survey of the whole of American Dante to to, to begin a collection of essays. So um, there's an awful lot more work to be done, and this is just like a preliminary report to you of work. I hope people will do. But um, and Jerry's point is, um, it's almost a rhetorical question: is how do you couch the presentation when? I often talk about the pencil is interested in this or the pencil interest in that. You don't need to make it absolutely um, about Whitman's intentionality. You can handle it one way or handle it another, I think. Uh, I don't see any other signs of intervention apart from the pencil. That would be answering your question. Yeah. And you, you 
you know, you could trace with and handwriting in that long passage, but it is interesting mm -hmm. to think about. You, you, your first reaction would always be that you can't really identify a parenthesis or an underlining, except one of the ways that Claire Bourne and Jason Scott Warren did identify Milton in the mm -hmm. free library first folio was by just the brackets that yeah. he's doing. And they, in other other Milton books, he did the same kind of brackets. Yeah. So, so I think someone may, you know, someone who knows Whitman's marginalia yeah. may may recognize yeah. this. Yeah. We have one of Whitman's pencils in our collection. Yeah. Have you sharpened it? <laughs> don't don't sharp it. Well, what do you think that? Yeah. Another whole area that I, I'm interested in learning more about from you guys is the way one talks about a kind of annotation, because I'm using adjectives like excitedly mm -hmm. and or yeah. adverbs rather, uh, the energy of annotation, the speed. And to me, this does look like somebody really engaging in a, uh, in a very, very close... Lovely. That is a tricky problem with mm -hmm. marginalia studies, yeah. Is, yeah. and I thought it was beautifully done. I mean, obviously one could, you know, quibble with... Mm -hmm those interpretive yeah. notes, but they, they, they were very convincing in the way that you read them emotively. And, mm -hmm. well, and also reading them against his own rough work. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting just to see how, you know, some of these things come out in different ways in right. his own writing. So yeah. he's, he's clearly being influenced by it. Yeah, I think it's easier, easy for marginal folks to dismiss the pencil, so mm -hmm. because it does seem so mm -hmm. insignificant, but you're kind of arguing the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah. I think also if you sit down and seance with the object for about two hours, which is why I didn't go through it, you do begin to get a feeling for what the pencil's doing, what the pencil's looking for, and how the pencil's moving. But that becomes almost metaphysical, doesn't it? I don't know how you could uh, convey that apart from just giving a report of the reading experience. But uh, amazingly, that's what's so beautiful about material text. That experience is there to be had. I mean, other people can go and read this text and, and see what what they what they think. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, David. You have given us actually a great number of arguments. <laughs> one is the argument of how what Whitman reads yeah. and how he translates the reading into his own words. Mm. The other is the intertextuality. Of color, non set of what yeah, yeah. Um, and I can continue with mm. photography and text. And mm -mm -mm -mm. What I'm particularly interested in is something that you bring throughout your presentation, mm. and that is going back and back, returning to the city walls mm -mm -mm. and kind of confronting the historical event with a power. That is everything, but not completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. And you, your argument in this case is twofold. First of all, that it parallels to what is going on in the Greek, because they also have unification and therefore are going to dump it. Mm -hmm. But also that Whitman is not alone. So your argument goes two ways. Whitman is unique, look at the pencil mark, mm -hmm. but Whitman is not unique, look at and the other. Yeah. And I wonder whether you can talk a little bit more about the historicity of what it means to make Dante poignant for the Civil War in American history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a way, the most extraordinary slide is this one, isn't it? I mean, where do you get a big fat date like that in literary studies, right? Yeah. July. <laughs> 1862, and it deliberately put there. And so I simply accreted around July 1862, what's actually going on there. This is, this is for me, the interest is different. You, you have said, well, who is Carl Witten? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my problem is not who is Carl Witten, it's not the guy over there in Germany, but why does he want to find out? Mm -mm -mm. And what kind of information network does he have to find out what is happening in Europe at that time yeah. and through different languages yeah. and not just really yeah. interesting. I think you're right. The, it, this does network Whitman, doesn't it, in ways that we haven't mm -hmm. thought about. We think of the, I mean, as a, you know, just a general person, I'm a kind of uh, a one-off. An international yeah. network. Yeah. But uh, international networks did find their way to Whitman, didn't they, in later years? I mean, people came to pay homage to Whitman. And, yeah. Mm -hmm.
I, th th in a sense, that's my favorite moment. It's sort of like in the horrors of, <laughs> in the horrors of civil war, what do you want? A really good, even better text of Dante. That's what I want, yeah. That's the enthusiasm there. Mm. I'm interested in the reference to Kamala and Sato Isakis. Mm. Why would you need to annotate that if it's fairly obvious for people who were Sato is mentioned? Is it? Yeah. Does it mean that, I mean, you, you suggested that you had read Sato Isakis closely? So why would you need to? Seems like it, yeah. So it's almost a question of who is he annotating for? Yes. Yeah, for whose benefit is it that he's doing this? And why does he put a big star there? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a good question. That is not unusual, I will say. Mm -hmm. Like that mm -hmm. people, people thing, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. just saying, I know, I know this, right. I yeah. got the reference. Yeah. You know? right. Because does that suggest that there is a sort of dialectical reading of Dante? No, maybe yes, <laughs> and something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, obviously, it might be just connecting the, the very fact that it's by his brother, and he thinks, ah, mm -hmm. there is some crossover because clearly he's a, an admirer of the other Carlyle. And so there's a moment where, you know, there's a kind of moment of crossover. So it might be an exuberant moment to give us that particular star there. Yeah. 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 Oh, say, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're right about that, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. a brother yeah. moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. We can Is that going to be in the? Uh... I'm going to stop the share. And... Okay. Yeah. Dee, do you want to unmute and 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 ask your question? Yeah, I don't know what happened. Uh, what happened to my radio? Sorry. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, 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 oh, this was a wonderful talk and uh, um, very evocative. And uh, we need I am, to. I know stress. Can you hear me? Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, no. I'm by no, by no stretch a Whitman scholar, but I did read Drum Taps just a couple of years ago. And I'm intrigued by that July 1862 date as well. Um, and I was a little taken aback in drum taps by how militaristic it is, at least the early, early stanzas. And, um, and it's interesting to me that you, you have here in July 1862, which is just the beginning of evidence that the Civil War is going to be a lot worse than people thought. No, it's just, I think it's the second battle of Bull Run. Mm -mm. We, have, we haven't hit any, you know, we're not up to Gettysburg for another year. You know, that I'm intrigued by the timing of Whitman's thoughts about this, and that he seems, from what you're showing, to be thinking about the carnage well ahead of when he's actually involved in it as a nurse mm -hmm. and before it really has happened yet. Mm -hmm. So, I think the first, my understanding historically, um, is that the second battle of Bull Run is that maybe what he's responding to in July 1862 was so much worse than anybody predicted. And then it went on from there, that this would be a turning point for him. It surprises me nonetheless that parts of Drum Chaps, if I'm reading it properly, are, are so gung-ho on war and battle and weaponry. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's kind of a, a contradiction within the, the same text but I'm thinking that you've hit a turning point for him mm. where, of course, he wants to justify the Civil War, but he's also seeing the beginning to see what's going to happen. You know, he's beginning to understand what's going to happen. Um, and that date, yes, that date is critical, it seems to me. So I'll leave it at that. I mean, I am not, I'm, I'm not a literary scholar. I'm not a witness scholar. It just so happened that I had just read, read Drum Taps. And that's, that's why I was intrigued yeah. by your talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a, it is an amazing text, Drum Taps, and you do get the scenes of absolute horror, but also kind of rah, rah, rah moments, don't you, of uh, cheering along the troops seen in Manhattan and uh, 
just being in, like enthusiastic like crowds in Europe in, in August 1914 uh, in the same text. And it just seems an extraordinary mixture. Yeah. Uh, David, just to um, turn a little different, I, one thing I loved about this was the um, <laughs> kind of uh, Dante bookshelf that you're giving us and in the 19th century, mm. which, you know, and there's probably, there's some Dante scholars on on here, so they'll know, but I'm, it's, it does feel like a sort of forgotten bookshelf in a way of, uh, and I wondered if you could, Characterizing me, there's a sort of competition for translations here in the mid eight in the mid nineteenth century. Is that the way we should look at it, or sort of a, um, you know, people sort of one upping each other? Um, how many how many are there between I don't know the eighteen twenties and the eighteen seventies? It seems like there's just you know we've forgotten most of these, and no mm -hmm. one would mm -hmm. ever teach them. Uh, maybe you'll bring it back, but. So that's one question, and then this other, I've just, I never thought of, of course, about the advantages of a prose translation, and a pretty scholarly one at that. I mean, I'm struck by, the, there's a ton of footnotes in there, and linguistic, kind of, I'm not sure exactly, linguistic references, other kinds of, so, you know, I just wonder if you had some other thoughts on Carlyle's own work as sort of scholar translator, and how he fits, or doesn't fit in this kind of world of forgotten Dante, uh, you know, uh, interventions? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the answer to the second question is I personally have not paid enough attention to the importance of Carlyle. Um, but I, I mean, the very fact that he embeds the Italian and surrounds yeah. it with the prose is so very important. And so there are many channels of influence that uh, um, the thing of it is that Carey got sort of frowned and uh, sainted really in his in, in, it became the canonical translation through the imprimatur of Coleridge and Wordsworth and that but it is a kind of grandiose grandiloquent kind of um, version of Dante a grand version of Dante and this is a much more nuts and bolts flesh and blood Dante mm. so I think I, I personally need to revise my thinking about that and the, the first part um, yeah I mean there is tremendous interest in Dante but a lot of it is centered in New England and in Cambridge Massachusetts where I mean the Dante Society of America was founded there it's still there I mean Dante studies is very much that New England uh, elite um, with you know Charles Eliot Norton and uh, there's a succession of three great teachers uh, Longfellow um, uh, oh Lowell who we mentioned earlier another one of them they're, they're just a succession of making the cult of Dante and the cult of New England superimposed to the extent that other people sort of look to it as with hope. Um, and I discovered an extraordinary text by an African-American man who, um, I think he was the son of slaves who thought if he could get to Harvard Yard, um, the spirit of Dante would speak to him and people would recognize him. And so he goes to Harvard Yard, uh, expecting it to be a place of liberation and he gets himself arrested. Uh, put in jail, uh, but then he sort of um, finds some sponsorship to learn Latin because he wants to become a scholar. So the the force field of Dante is is great as uh, for African Americans, and so when I teach Dante, I do quite a lot about African American Dante, leading all the way to um, Baraka's The System of Dante's Inferno, which is a ferocious text. Um, Difficult to teach, dangerous to teach, but an amazingly compelling account of the what it is to be black in America in the 1960s, 100 years on. And uh, there's signs of engagement that um, Baraka did indeed struggle with with, with Dante directly. Uh, I think he actually used Longfellow's translation, best as I can determine. And of course, you mentioned Douglas a lot since you opened that. But did you did you say that we know Douglas read Dante, or is it just a sort of your you're sort of putting them in conversation, but do we, did Douglas, Douglas refer to Dante in his? Yeah, no, he, um, in his newspaper, um, oh, Dante right. is re regarded as a great national liberation leader. And so before Italy could exist, Dante is a liberation leader. So the, the phrase is uh, Italia prima dell'Italia, Italy before Italy can exist. 
uh, is embodied in its in its great writers, Dante, Boccaccio, Petrarch, the Tre Corone, the Three Crowns. And so Dante is that liberation leader who in 1865 is then commemorated as if it's like a personal triumph for the unification of Italy. Yeah. So. Um, but also there's, um, Baraka is, there's also a competitive element with African-American writers vis-a-vis -vis Dante. And so the opening line of Baraka's, the system of Dante's hell is, but Dante's hell is heaven. It's an amazing line. You think you've seen suffering. Let me tell you what suffering looks like from an African-American perspective. Yeah. Mm. I guess I just wanted to ask how you see Dante's vision of hell, which is hell, but also order, mm. as a Picasso present mm. in a sense, in a way that, for instance, Orthos, and you know, I see someone with their eye, arm, their abdomen mm. being shot off. Mm -mm. Production, or is it something else? Yeah, I mean, Whitman is that paradox, isn't he? Somebody with great expansive vision, looking at the whole of America, the whole of humankind, but it is song of myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, it is about him, and actually, his um, his engagement with African Americans uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Kramer, the editor of Drum Taps, is very hard on Whitman, and. Um, it's not so much part of Whitman's liberatory project, I don't think. So, yeah. What What was Whitman's? I mean, how how much Italian did he yeah. know? Because I think I am interested in the kind of the translation aspect here, which mm -hmm. is which is um, particularly now, perhaps you know, prose translations are pretty denigrated, um, but they are very useful for someone with some. Italian, maybe yeah. maybe not perfect, right? Because you can, you know, I love the prose. Is it Talbot Donaldson who did the prose Beowulf? Or there's the, there's a, the prose Beowulf that I read when I was learning Anglo-Saxon was way better, way more useful yeah. than any, than like a Seamus Heaney or someone, right? Yeah. Because you really can work back and forth with, yeah. with the text. And so that was my guess of what Whitman's doing here, but I realized I don't know actually what Whitman is. I mean, he must know some Italian because he's translating Giorno into the Latin yeah, 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 yeah. triangulated word, but I don't know what his familiarity was. I mean, do we know? The status of Italian is, is just so very interesting. It's an elite language in New England, mm -hmm. but there's also phases of immigration beginning to happen and that completely changes the status of yeah. Italian in the United States to becomes a kind of anti-Catholic panic. And so where he is along that line, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I agree about prose does deliver you back to the Italian. So you're sort of like, mm. so you're constantly sort of looking like that. Although a really, really, a really, really good uh, poetic translation can do that in, in a parallel text. And my, my favorite translator is actually Mandelbaum because he's always doing that. He's always, you, you say, well, why have you done that? And you go, oh, I see, okay. And even on the, the the level of syntax and other things. He, Mandelbaum is terrific. Um, my best friend is Robin Kirkpatrick, and he's got a great translation of Dante, but it, it's just a bit further away from Dante. Uh, you need to know Dante in English and Italian before you can really get Robin, but Mandelbaum is always enables that shuttling. Yeah. But somebody will be able to answer your question, maybe a PhD student, great thesis mm -hmm. there to be written, uh, Whitman's Italian, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess one thought is that, you know, he, can, he was in Brooklyn a long time. Yeah. He may have picked up the, some Italian when he was working in the yeah. newspaper yeah. industry. I mean, that's quite likely, maybe not a lot, but you know, he may have at least some familiarity because of that. Yeah, and people were getting tutoring in Italian, and, people, and Italians were earning a living teaching Italian. Well, he's also, he's trying to learn things himself. Yeah. So, you know, he's yeah, he's a real autodidact. Uh, yeah. I mean, he, I mean, there's that side. I think it's interesting that 
I mean, it, it, it would appear that he only had one mm. translation of that. This one. Well, also Longfellow later. He did have a Longfellow yeah. later? Yeah. Because he doesn't talk about the Longfellow. Yeah, apparently he does. It's in the Library of Congress. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Also, we're. Well, he may not get, I mean, is that yeah. one marked up? Yeah. So the question is, yeah. he may have had it, he didn't read it. Right. Good question. Uh, um, see, Marco is here. Uh, we're, talk we're talking about uh, Italian. We, we have to be very careful because Italian is many languages uh, in this period, right? Uh, maybe until the 1950s. And so what's coming out of people's mouths uh, isn't standard Italian, it's many different varieties of Italian, so literary Italian is something else. Yeah. yeah. Yes, but I did, I, I guess, did Carlisle also do the free story and Sam Paradiso? No, <clears throat> no. Um, one, one other question, the and, and that has been sort of what do you make of this, and I don't know what the answer. Um, you've looked at the underlines in the text, and that's where where um, Whitman is calling attention to himself or, or thinking about it. In his note about the the new German edition, he underlines new edition and four manuscripts. So who is he underlining for <laughs> I think he's just getting excited. Yeah. Yeah. It's just sharing excitement, like you know, it could be like upper upper case or something like that. So that's how I'd interpret it. Yeah. I mean, this theme is not so much in Italian. Yeah. And and while we're about it, I mean, and what about Carlyle, Thomas Carlyle? I, I wonder what Jean Michel thinks of Carlyle, because I mean, extraordinarily famous, but I just think a lot of his writing is intellectually absolutely feeble, really. I mean, compared to the kind of systematic thinking of the Germans of the period, right? I mean, he's writing on heroes and epics and all the rest of it. He just makes it up out of his head. There's no, there's no, yeah, there's no scholarship in it at all. But he needed to earn a living by giving public lectures, and so he just churned this stuff out and made made some money. It's dreadful stuff, right? So, yeah. What do you think? Would make his younger song. Right, right, right. You know, he learned, he learned nationalism mm -mm. for the Americans. Yeah, that's not a bad thing to do. Yeah. That's already so. Right, right. And of course, by the time of Ivo Bosch, it's really terrifying, the fascistic and so on. But not the younger one. Right. It's really revolutionary. Yeah. So yeah. Distinction. Make that distinction. Yeah. And that's why when the brother, when he met with the work of the young, mm -hmm. the earlier work, mm -hmm. come on. Yeah, one other thing to note about, about that note that's interesting, it would be great to share this paper with people like Ed Folsom and some of the great Whitman scholars. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I just, I'm surprised. I don't think of Whitman as someone who's going to be like the four manuscripts, you know, that's like, you know, I never would have put that kind of scholarly sensibility in, in, in Walt Whitman. And so that, I mean, I'm not saying I know the whole of his work enough, but yeah. I wonder how much of that work is used though. Uh, like, yeah. you know, like in the end, people are so close to yeah. publishing the fact. And, right. You know, people must have known. Yeah. They did yeah. 850 manuscripts, give or take, and the only full retention of the tradition is yesterday. Like in the critical edition, that's the only full uh, manuscripts of that specific work that is only now available. So I wonder if. Before more or around the same time or more than the publishers that to come and see that it's also trying to mm -hmm. in these four best mm -hmm. manuscripts uh what it means. So I mean, yeah. yeah. in the news that this Yeah, that could have read that makes sense. It's probably right. Because yeah, how well that that could just uh blow any conversation that we don't know about. But I think energies are running down and it's very cold outside, yeah. isn't it? So we could Shall we call an end? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.